society. A group of people. We're not an individual. And I preached, you know, the last time, two weeks ago, I was uh, speaking about the fact that uh, one person doesn't constitute the church. And Jesus loves the church because it is his bride. Uh, he's endeared to his church. He said, I will build my church. And he did. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And uh, the gates of Hades can't prevail against I guarantee you the loss of electricity or COVID or the death of my sister or your brother or whoever else. It really is not going to stop us from doing what God wants us to do and be who he wants us to be. And that's what I want to talk about today is the, the joy of being part of the body of Christ. Uh, and we want to go back just for a moment and read once again some of the verses that uh, were just read to us in the morning reading. Uh, in verses 11 and 12 we read, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers he established all of those positions in the church. Now we know the apostles were just for a temporary period. We know that there were 12 apostles, and we know that John was the last one to survive uh, before he passed away. And they gave us the scriptures. We have the New Testament because of them, but then there were prophets who also wrote. James was one of those prophets, and we have book of James and uh, Jude and as you go into the New Testament you see the work of the prophets that were present in the church in the first century but we're also told in 1 Corinthians uh, 13 that the, the gift of prophecy would pass so just like the apostles would pass away the prophets would come and go they wouldn't be there forever but they were there for a period of time to reveal God's will to his church in the first century and to write it down for us so that we could sit here and open up our Bibles and read what God wanted to say to the church in the first century and what he wants to say to the church today. But then it talks about the evangelists, and we do have evangelists. That was not something that was miraculous in its nature, and they weren't given all of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Some were, but uh, it was not the last forever, according to 1 Corinthians 13. And so we don't have the gifts that they had in some areas, but we do have the job of getting out and telling the good news. That's what the word evangelist means. It's a good newser. Somebody goes and tells the good news. And we still have that obligation to put all the world preach the gospel to every creature. And so then it mentions the pastors. And Bill and I serve as the elders of the church here. And another term for elder in the scripture is to be a pastor to take care of the sheep of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we try to do right here. And teachers, and they had teachers with gifts that would enable them to know the will of God without having to actually read from the text. In the first century, we don't have that gift, but we have the word that they wrote, and we can use that and be able to deliver God's message to the whole church. But why did God assign all of these positions, some of them temporary, some of them permanent, uh, and then, you know, we just wonder if the church today doesn't have all of these offices and then receive every month a new book put in the Bible, another chapter. It's not there. Uh, what was he trying to accomplish? Well, it tells us what he was trying to accomplish in the first century and then with the prolongation of those services in the church. Now, what he's trying to do. It says to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Jesus said, I will build my church. Well, that's one of the reasons these men were given the jobs that they were given by God, the work they had to do, and why they were equipped to do that work according to God's plan. And it's because he wanted to build up his church. When we come together and we have a small group like today, it's kind of hard to say, well, we're really building up the church. We hope so. And we're thankful to those of you who didn't come, who have been proven to have COVID or probably might be exposed to COVID and uh, yet at the same time it's you know kind of lonesome in here without the whole crowd being present and we've got a marriage seminar coming up this weekend and we're hoping that we'll get a, a large number of our members back as well as visitors that we have invited to come and be with us for a whole Saturday that's coming up and uh, we're going to stress that even more as we go along but he equipped the church works of service 
Some of the translations will say for ministry. To minister. Why? Because that's what the word is in the Greek language. And what does it mean? It means to serve. To minister is to serve. And that's what they wanted these men who were chosen to fill these offices to do. To equip the church to serve. And uh, I know that a lot of people don't understand that concept. They, they, they think about going to church. They, they think maybe their service is getting going to the service of the church. And that's the full extent of it. But that's not what God wanted. What he really wanted were people to be working in the service that he has assigned to us. The jobs that he has given to us. And uh, if we don't do that, then we're not being the church that God wanted to establish. We have to do that. And uh, so we look at the, the work of these apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers and say, what were they trying to do? Get the church ready to go to work. Get the church ready to do what it had to do. And I, I, I dreamed even last night about things that are happening here. And, you know, I, I think I just go... You know, Austin and his willingness to read, to preach, to teach, to come and be with us when he didn't have a whole lot of other young people around to help out. And uh, then I think about Teresa and her work with the Eagle Academy, which has just, you know, been limited because of the COVID and things like that. But she's also been very faithful and dedicated. We'll go back to Masha and look at her and think, well, there's the one that takes care of all the finances and that uh, brought in the bulletins today. And, you know, Farrell, Barry, you know, teachers, you go back and we got some new arrivals that are getting ready. And uh, what my job is to equip you for the work of ministry as well as long as you're in this congregation and Grant's already cranking up. And uh, he came in, came a Christian, and has his parents with him. And then the guys that put all this together this morning and uh, have been faithful all their lives as we look at Sandra and Alec and know how much they're dedicated to God's service. It's, it's incredible. And, uh, you know, when a woman gets up in the morning and puts clothes on that many kids, bathes them, wash behind their ears and all that sort of thing, and then drives for uh, an hour or more to be able to get there to worship. And that's what Sophia does every Sunday. And Brad told me he never, ever really directed the uh, Lord's Supper, never done communion and ministering in that area. And uh, now this was the second time, I think, that that's happened. And uh, we hope to have more of him. Patricia, oh, how many people has she served with her talents as a nurse and Bill as an elder? And Ben uh, has a lot of problems with his health, but you can count on him to be on Wednesday nights and study with us. And he has been very, very faithful in his family. I mean, just everybody, everybody that's here. And uh, and have got our sister. Hey, we're going to get you into service here too soon. That's my job, you know, it's, it's ready to serve. And we don't want just people to drop in every now and then that they've done their part. Let's read verse 16 again, too. For him, the whole body, from Jesus, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. <laughs> This morning with you, the song service, and he does so much to help us as well. And uh, he talked to Grant about coming and worshiping with us, and Grant brought his parents. It's just, you know, I look around the room and I, and I haven't even touched the end of the door, and I dreamed about this. Thank you for getting into my dreams at six in the morning, but uh, they just came to me, you know, and I got to thinking in my, in my dreams uh, about all of this, and I woke up because of my preaching on this subject. And I woke up and I thought, wow, everybody is working. And then you think, okay, where's the growth? Well, it's there. It's just not here. We have just problems to move out of town. We've had a lot of people leave. We've, you know, uh, seen uh, decay in that area. But uh, we have a lot of great people still online as well as here. And people that are willing to work. I know how much you put into these efforts. Uh, you can't you can't avoid if you are part of this church ending up in uh, uh, Frank's kitchen and dining room 
and enjoy some good food and fellowship. They host a lot of things. And it's just everybody. Everybody has participated. When one of our Spanish speaking members down at Inglewood gets sick and needs to be operated on, Barry, not trying to divulge what you did, but you know that they gave quite a bit of money to help his operator with his operation. Anybody gets sick, they get served. Anybody passes away or lose someone, they 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 have people come and attend them and, and call them and pray with them. And it's just so encouraging, it really is. Uh, we may be a young church, we may be struggling in some areas, but we've got great people here. Great people, and that's you. And it says here that uh, these people were trained so the church could be built up, but it depends on each part doing its work. That's the key. And the last verse of verse 16. Everybody's got to be willing to pitch in and do their part. One of the things that I've noticed is this week there we got a sign of the list of people who are coming to our marriage seminar on Saturday. It's going to be from nine to four. And it's going to be, I think, really exciting. And we know that Wayne and Tammy are experts in their field. And so we'll try and also keep it recorded for those of you that can't be here. I know that uh, we said next time we'll be out of town, but we'll have it for you. And I uh, want you to be able to learn from their experiences. They've done over 100 married seminars. But as you put on that together, as all these people working for the kingdom of God, willing to sacrifice, I know that Danny, uh, yesterday, when he wanted to get off the couch, had to my help to get up. Did you notice any of that this morning? No. No. And he's not saying he's a martyr or that we should uh, admire him excessively, but uh, it, it is beautiful to see him get out of bed, come on down here, and leave the same. I would, you know, you really would suffer if he didn't do that because what you want, you got the COVID, and, and, uh, and Jim Ellingson is up in the mountains of North Colorado with his daughter. Now, they says one song leader with a lot of experience, and that's Danny. And if he wasn't going to come, <clears throat> I was going to have to leave the song school. And so uh, that would have been real torture. Now, that would have been Christian sacrificing and suffering, but uh, uh, he was willing to get out of here because he didn't want to do that to you, and he protected you from me. So that's, that's part of his service today. But every part of the body has got to be functioning. Now, an illustration of the Old Testament, you go back to the book of Nehemiah, when they're rebuilding the walls around the city of Jerusalem that had been destroyed by their enemies, and uh, Nehemiah is just heartbroken. He was a cup bearer for the king of Persia, and he was just at the point of tears. The king noticed that and said, what's wrong? Well, you know, my people don't have a walled city, and they're subject to being raided by anybody, anytime. And people just ride their horse in front of their chariot right through town and steal everything they have. And we, we need walls around the city of Jerusalem. So he was given permission and authority to leave his job and go and rebuild the walls. But when he got there, he had worked as kind of like the guys that are here at the hotel that are in charge of uh, food and drinks. If they have a banquet in here, then uh, they have to coordinate that and have to be capable of administrating and organizing and executing. And that is exactly what Nehemiah did in Persia. So when he comes out and gets back home to Jerusalem and has to rebuild the wall, he does a great job of organizing it. And he calls the Jewish people together and says, we're going to rebuild this wall. But our enemies are going to attack us. No, they won't. We're going to make everybody hold a sword in their hand while they get one hand in to mix the cement with the other one, and we're going to rebuild that wall. Well, uh, where do I start? Where do you live? And they would define where they live, who they were, and then he would give them a section of the wall that his family would have to rebuild. So that man would go build his portion, another man would build his portion. Each one had his part of the wall to build. And each one of them did his part. And the amazing thing, as you read three chapters of the book of uh, uh, Ezra, is that they finished in 52 days. Their enemies were going to attack them, but uh, then they realized these guys are armed. They're waiting on us. They're 
not afraid of us. We can't go down there just unprepared. We can't get ready. But by the time they got ready, Nehemiah and his crowd had rebuilt the walls because each one did his part. And you'd say, well, what if one person had not done his part? Then you would have a wall around the city with a big gaping hole where a foreign army could just march through. It was dependent upon every family doing their part. And they did. And as a result, 52 days later, to the surprise of their enemies, they were fortified. Jerusalem was restored in so far as their security was concerned. But each person had to do his part. And that's exactly what Paul says to the Ephesians. Everybody's got to do his part. Okay, and so what do you call that? Ministry. And what's the word, the verb that goes with that? Serve or minister. And each of you should use whatever gift you receive to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. God's grace doesn't come in just one form. It's not just taking food to the hungry or sheltering somebody that has no way to get out of the rain or buying a pair of shoes for somebody that's barefooted and walking in the snow. It, you know, there's all kinds of things you can do or being a nurse or just helping somebody that's down, get up and walk fine, talking, counseling, working with them, sharing God's word with them. It, there's so many ways in which we can administer God's grace to other people. And that's why we exist as a church to minister to serve, and each one must do his part. And that raises, that raises a question. Have you discovered your part? Uh, I can imagine something comical in, in Jerusalem as they're getting ready to rebuild the walls and put up their defenses. If uh, all of a sudden somebody forgot where he lived and started working on somebody else's plot, well, that might work with the neighbor who he's helping, but it wouldn't take care of his responsibility to build a wall where his house was and to protect the city that way. Anybody that didn't do his part, and maybe even if he was very helpful with somebody else in doing their part, uh, or if he applauded the work that others did but didn't do his, anybody, then you would have a hole in the wall of Jerusalem that anybody could march through. Everybody had to build the wall where they were assigned to build. And they had to know where they live. Don't forget that, Alzheimer's can do it. But uh, remember where you live and then build the wall that you're supposed to be able to cover that space and make sure the city is safe from their enemies. But in the church, I don't know. I think some people think, well, I, I think my part is to get up on Sunday morning. And if I need to, I think bad. I mean, uh, hold my hair, brush my feet. Eat a little something and run down and uh, sit for an hour and listen to the Bob Brown preach a boring sermon or something and then they go home and I've done my part for the whole week. No, you haven't done your part. You haven't done your part. I'm a little disappointed this morning that somebody I spoke to during the week and gave one of our cards to uh, told me he would be here today and uh, he didn't make it. But I really was impressed with him and his little boy that he had. Reminded me of one of my grandbabies, and uh, I was thinking that he probably really would come and then tomorrow, maybe he'd meet me Sunday, and he would just say, Oh, you're modern, Bob Goldstock, in his sermon last week. <laughs> he didn't care if that embarrassed. But uh, we, we have to do our part, and I don't know what your part is. Uh, Kelly is asking, please don't mention me so much in your sermons and so forth, but I know uh, the amount of prayer time she uses. Unbelievable. Uh, I don't pray that much. And, uh, but I don't feel too embarrassed about that because I pray enough, I think. But uh, I don't know much as she does. But then I think also about the people she serves, whether it's telephone calls, texts, whether it's going to see somebody, teaching somebody, uh, helping the ladies with their ladies program. Carol teaches also. They just, you know, so many opportunities to serve, genuinely serve. And uh, when we 
get in real bad trouble medically. Sometimes we call Patricia up and help. She would always be willing to give us advice and help. And sometimes she would take care of us. Sometimes she counts on Patricia to share her knowledge as well. And so we need we need to be looking for our heart. Which piece of the wall of the church are you constructing? And I think about it, it's this Saturday. Uh, there's still so many things that we need to hear. And I know a lot of it's already been covered, but uh, we got to have ice and we got to have soft drinks and uh, we got to have uh, food delivered by Jason's Deli and we got to feed a bunch of people right here at these very tables. And we're going to have guests that come in that we don't know who they are. We're going to have to find out. Some will have signed up like they were supposed to, RSVP. Others will not have, but we'll be thrilled to have them anyway and we need to get their information. We need, we need to find out from uh, Tammy and from uh, Wayne what they need here. I know that the doors uh, that separate us right here, that door right behind the building, Patricia, uh, has a wall that comes out and cuts this room into two so that when Wayne's ready to go here, she can be over there and vice versa. I uh, don't think we can use two sound systems in here, so they're going to have to speak up maybe. All of those things. And even today, when we got here, uh, Alexander was trying to get the equipment together and doing a good job of things, and he came in and uh, his part of it at the end, and here we are. And we're having a wonderful time together. We are all consuming and uh, having a great chance to preach to people that are not even present in this room. But there's just some things that we're going to have that are organized for a Saturday morning at 8.45 when you know, Wayne said he had invited me driving in. And so we've got to get off of that done. We've got to cover his expenses and Monster and I have already been talking about that some. And Bill and I have consulted and it's just details, details, details. But hey, you think there weren't any details that him and I had to deal with to rebuild that wall around the city of Jerusalem to keep his people from being chopped to death by their enemies or swords? Of course, there were details and, and activity and late nights, and that's just a part of being a Christian. So every, you have to do your part, but you can't do your part until you identify what your part is. And maybe leading the song service next week, bread is not what you're supposed to be doing normally. Okay, that's not our gift, and that's not something we can put to. Hey, you did your part today, and the others did their part, and I'm trying to do my part. And we need to each one identify what it is I'm able to do and do well that really is necessary to be a help to the church. And uh, when we're sick, when we're not able to get out like we want to and do everything we'd like to do. We're not going to be held responsible for not doing our part if it's impossible. But uh, that's not usually the case. Usually it's just that we haven't determined what our part is other than just showing up. And we're not doing anything to help other people enough. And we need to identify the areas where we are already working or where we can work more, where we can do more for the church. You can ask people. I, mean, I was just, uh, like I said, Talking about this guy, Mark, I was just giving my cell phone uh, a new battery. He's dying out too quick. And so I went to a shop over here that fixes phones and they were going to change it out for me. But while I was waiting, I noticed this man that was in there with his little boy, and his little boy was uh, looking at a cell phone and the dad got down on his knees on the floor right there in front of his little boy, was sitting in a chair and said, This is going to be your cell phone. And da 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 da. And he did. This is what you can do with it. This is what I'm going to let you do with it. And I bet you'll have a cell phone. And I, mean, I heard him mention God in one of the statements. And uh, I could just tell this is a man who has had some experience in reading the scriptures and knows about God. And he loves his son a lot. And uh, that's so great. So when I was getting ready to leave, I pulled out one of my business cards that has this hotel on it, you know. And, the address where we meet and when we meet. And I told him, I said, uh, my name's Bob. He said, his name's Mark. He said, my name's your son. And he said, uh, uh, yeah, I'm not okay. I said, I can help you a hope. And he took the car and looked at it. And he said, oh, we just moved to town two months ago. We're looking for a church where we can worship. 
How many people would have been running to every day that are in that same position and we could talk to them if we wanted to, but we don't realize that's a part of what we can do. And it's an easy part. And uh, how do you build a church? Well, if everybody's down there inviting everybody in the community to come, somebody will come. And that's how the church gets built. If Dan is working over in the dish and all of a sudden he decides to ask one of his co workers to come. And Maria came a couple weeks ago, but hadn't been back. We got to talk to her. But uh, if everybody just asks somebody, would you like to come and worship? You'd be surprised how many people will say yes. And if they've had problems in life and they're you know, everybody complains. I complain. You complain. And people around us are always complaining. Well, why don't you tell them where? They could get some help, you know. Could I get together with you and pray about that? What? Could I come and sometime when you're free and maybe we get a cup of coffee and pray about that? That will do so much good. It calls people to want to come and worship with us on a regular basis. You got to define your part. But mind your own business, okay? That's what Jesus said. John chapter 21, he's talking to Peter about what Peter needs to do. I mean, this is, you know, the last chapter of the book of John, he's getting ready to die, he's getting ready to crucify uh, and leave him, and uh, he's going to ascend into heaven now. And so, what does he want the apostles to stand back to do? He tells Peter, feed my sheep. Take care of my sheep. Feed my sheep. Three times. Peter, he was, you know, was probably trying to figure out what his part whole show was, and uh, Jesus was trying to tell him, be my sheep. And, and he told him once, told him again, told him the third time, be my sheep. And then what did Peter do? He looked around and saw the beloved disciple, as he's known, John. And he said, well, what about him? And that's when Jesus said, mind your business. He didn't did, did use other words. Uh, but that's basically what he said. If I want him to stay here and know I come back, that would be a couple thousand years later, right? Uh, that's that's not your business. That, you don't need to worry about that. Don't worry about what his part is. Think about your part. I told you three times. Your part is to be my sheep. And, and him, it's not even it's not your concern. Just worry about what your part is. You know that's all. Of people that do go to church and say, Well, I wonder what that preacher is doing. He's doing the right thing, he's doing enough, he's, what they pay him, or whatever his family's like. And they go through all of that and they're trying to figure out how to fix up my life or your life, but not their lives. They're more concerned about if I'm carrying out my responsibility to do my part, and they're not. Worry about whether or not they are doing their part. And that's what Jesus is telling Peter. Don't worry about what John has to do. He said, if I want John to stay until I come back, which would mean that John about right now would be over 2,000 years old. Um, he said, if I want him to stay here until I come back to earth, come back to receive you guys and take you to heaven, uh, that's okay, I knew that. And that's what that's what John will do. But uh, that's not your problem, Peter. Your problem is you need to figure out how you're going to feed my sheep. Find out what your party is. Concentrate on that. And don't worry about what everybody else is doing or not doing. We are the ministers and not what? I don't mind sitting here looking at me while I preach. I'm so thankful you're here. So thankful that you're zooming in if that's the case. But, you know, that's not what we're called. We're not called. This is not a football game. And uh, we need what we need are people that can cover the mound and pitch. We need people that can be catchers back at home plate. We need people who are shortstops and real fast and picking up grounders. We need people who can cover the outfield. But you can't have your outfielders in a baseball game running into home plate trying to replace the catcher. Or going up into the stands and sitting down and just watching the game. That's not what they're there for. It's not what they got hired for. 
And uh, so we need to figure out my pitcher, a catcher, an outfielder, an infielder. What's, what's my part? But I have to do my part, not somebody else's part. I need to worry about my part, not their part. And I need to get busy and do what I'm supposed to do. Benjamin Franklin and some guys got an idea. Ah, uh, we're colonies, and we're trying to be colonies, and we're being taxed without representation, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I think it's time that we write a declaration of independence and sign that thing. A group of leaders in the colonies, and that we're going to form a federation, which we have, a country with its own constitution. And his remarks were, if you read right here, we must indeed do what? All hang together. Or, most assuredly, we shall all hang separately. And you know what he meant by being hung separately, right? The English is going to pull out some nice rope, and we're all going to be hung from the highest tree. But if we hang together, if we're unified, and work like the Jews did. You do your part of on the wall, I'll do my part of the wall. I'll do behind my house, you do behind your house, and we'll totally surround this city with a huge wall that our enemies can't penetrate, and we'll be safe. But each has to do his own part. You got to then evaluate what part is yours, where am I building? And then you build there consistently. You don't keep looking over to portion to see what he's doing and you hang together everybody working together each one doing his own part i think about ants uh you go to proverbs 6 verse 6 and you look at uh there the wise man solomon says consider the ants you know i i've read that verse thought about it many times but this time something new came to my mind and that happens to us doesn't it? you read the bible and you go back reread it and all of a sudden you see something you didn't see before. I got to think. Solomon and all his wisdom, brains, sitting there looking at ants. Uh, I can imagine myself walking on, you know, and seeing you come on the path and seeing King Solomon sitting out there in the field looking at an ant bed. If you grew up in Mississippi, you know, somewhere like that, you don't know what an ant bed is. And sometimes here in Colorado, they get pretty big. And they're interesting. People have, you know, a little plantation type ant container in their bedrooms, even, and they watch how the ants build and make grooves and caves and how they coordinate their efforts. But this is amazing here. And uh, we know they hang together, like Benjamin Franklin said, we need to hang, they literally hang together. If they've got to go across an empty space or got to cross a stream or there's water, they link together and hold together. What happens if some of them decide we, we're just going to do our own thing? Y'all go ahead. Uh, the bridge breaks and they all fall. So if somebody didn't do his part in building his gap in their situation, they can't cross rivers, they can't cross ditches, they can't go across a mud puddle, they can't do anything. They can't sustain themselves in mid air and everybody travel across the backs of their uh, fellow ants. We have to work together and hang together. And then, as we close out, I want to mention this story. There was an aqueduct built, finished about 109 years after the birth of Jesus, which means Jesus hadn't been dead very long when the Romans started building this thing and finally completed it. What was it for? To bring fresh water from real Creel, we would say in Spanish. And you come and get that water to go down into the sea where they could get a thing. And for 1800 years, 1800 years, water flowed in Spain and Segovia over this aqueduct down the duct that's on the top. Why is it so tall? Because they had to consider levels for the water to flow. And the people enjoyed the water that came into the city because of the aqueduct and it survived almost forever but then somebody decided we need to start a historical society for the 
preservation and the salvation of the aqueduct. So that many, 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 many generations that come will be able to come by here and see it. But if we just keep using it to bring water in, just use it, let, let them do that common service and bring water to the city, uh, it eventually probably will wear down and decay and go away. They cut the water off and water ceased to flow in the Segovia on this aqueduct. And you want to guess what happened in just no time flat? This thing began to dry up, builds work concrete, he knows, and then just rots. It turns into sand instead of rock. And eventually, the aqueduct began to deteriorate. They had to save it, uh, reconstructing it almost, and uh, deciding maybe we ought to let it work. When you don't work, what happens to you? Let me tell you what the Dow Whitlow, who those of us who were here at the very beginning of this congregation heard, he worked for Lockheed Martin. And he said, if people retire from our company after long years of hard service, oh, bury you there, just quit. I'm out. I'm going to relax, enjoy life a little bit, and just sit around. Usually their life uh, expansion after that's not one year. He said, wow, he died after one year of retirement. And then I began to investigate, find out that's true about other industries and other businesses. And it is. Human beings need to be using their brain as well as the muscles in their arms and back in order to survive. And so when the Bible tells us that each one needs to do his part and everybody we need to be trained for works of service and that uh, everybody needs to be busy, then it's really a plan for a long life of happiness and health. And uh, as long as we can, we should. And so, uh, those that don't want to work at all, don't want to accomplish anything, won't live very long. And I want to give you one other idea. I was hesitant about including this in the message because so many people have come back as collateral damage from the wars that we've been involved in. And there's programs on TV all the time asking for money for homes for people who are handicapped and came back from the war. Others have a natural handicaps and nothing to do with their service and on the battlefield or anything like that. But uh, anytime you see it in you know, all of us, when we see somebody that is struggling, can't hardly walk, can't do the things that others would do. And, uh, and sometimes they're valiant and they get out and do all kinds of uh, unusual things. But instead it, you know, allow them to run and walk and couldn't do that before. Uh, the Haiti situation, we just heard about the earthquake, and so many people died, but a lot of people lost limbs as well. And um, I had a friend who worked on getting money for our government to go over and help people who had lost their arms and legs in the earthquake they had about 15 or 20 years ago. It was just about as bad as what they had this time. And uh, trying to get prosthetics on so they can be living a normal life as best as you can imagine. Now, we feel sympathy for people who have lost a member of their body. And I want you to think about the body of Christ. First Corinthians 12, 12 through 20 talks about how we have arms and legs in the church. Jesus is the head, but then we have the hand and the foot and the eye are mentioned as different parts of the body that are essential and necessary and wonderful. And it says, uh, you know, if you lose one of those, what have you got? You've got a handicapped church. If you lose people who could be serving, who just want to be spectators but don't want to be workers, people who don't want to really contribute to the cause, People are not inviting others, etc., etc., etc. Don't teach classes uh, or do whatever they can do. Uh, you just lost a hand. 
Now they've lost a foot. We don't consider that when somebody moves out of town. For those of you that are watching online today, like Kathy, who's a great partner. But uh, no, you're not one of the handicapped ones. But uh, there are a lot of people who never determine what their part in rebuilding uh, the wall, or as we would say today, building the church. They don't ever figure that out. Consequently, they don't dedicate themselves to that. And as a result, they're not doing what God wants them to do. And it handicaps the church when you have spectator members instead of servants. And I think you can believe and understand that. And finally, we read in 1 Peter 2 9. But you are a chosen people, we're special, a royal priesthood, that's the word, a holy nation. It's a responsibility. God's special possession were appreciated. That you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into marvelous, wonderful light. So that's the message for today. And it's a time when we're being faced with a lot of problems and a lot of difficulties as a corporate body, all churches. Are saying the same thing when I get online and read. I see that the, what we're experiencing, they're experiencing. And nobody likes it. We don't like to see the members having to stay at home, having to get it on Zoom. But then we don't want anybody just sitting around assuming when they could do, like Hebrews 10 25 says, and assemble together so we can see each other and talk and hug each other and not worry about COVID, hopefully. Your future. So, uh, God bless you. We have a really hard working body, and I appreciate all of you for that. And uh, that's why God's church in Highland Branch is going to succeed and grow that new way. God bless you. And I hope everybody at home is trying to stay away.